Our next speaker is Victor, and he's going to talk about the only thing that matters in DevOps. So I hope you all are DevOps to see what matters really. <laughs> but give him a warm welcome. OK. Thank you. This is blinding. OK, so I'm going to talk about DevOps and platform engineering, and I'm going to show you some demo. Or maybe I will not, depends on the time I have. Uh, so uh, this is my face. If you ask me questions at the end of this session, I work for Abound. Uh, uh, it's a company behind Crossplane. I will show you Crossplane later, open source, not selling you anything. So don't worry about that part. I have Twitter, I have books, I have stuff. No, does not matter. What does matter is that I will speak about DevOps, right? Now, uh, most of the time when I speak with people and uh, I come to the basic conclusion that most of people who now have the title DevOps uh, are doing more or less the same things that they were doing before. Uh, and that's cool because DevOps pays better than if you're called uh, Jenkins administrator. And uh, usually the conversations are something along the line, hey, what do you do? I'm DevOps. Okay, so what does it mean for you? Oh, you know, I do containers. I manage Kubernetes. I, I, I have a credit card to AWS account. And, uh, you know, usually uh, that ends up being people who were uh, doing a great job before uh, and now they're just renamed themselves. Um, without really changing drastically uh, or uh, considerably what that work is, right? We work with ops tools. And all those tools that I'm mentioning here, right, uh, and many, many others, they're just operational tools, uh, not directly. I mean, they can help us in many, many different ways, but that does not really make anybody uh, DevOps. Uh, and even if it does, the real question is comes, right? If we define DevOps as a way to join operational and development expertise into one team that is self-sufficient and capable of delivering application from the very beginning until it's running in production, if DevOps is about removing the walls between different departments, different groups, and joining them into a single team, uh, then the real question is, what should application developers do with all those tools that I mentioned before, right? With uh, those, right? Because it takes two years to figure out Kubernetes. And once you figure out Kubernetes, you realize that Kubernetes itself is useless and that you still need to figure out how service mesh works. And you need to figure out how CNIs work. And you need to figure out how Argo CDR Flux works and so on and so forth. So after two years, you realize that you are still not there. And if you want to figure out AWS, which has approximately 1,000 services today, uh, it will take you years as well, and so on and so forth. So it is completely unrealistic to expect that we are going to have self-sufficient teams capable of not only writing code, but delivering that code to production uh, to just say, hey, take those tools, right? Or even better, here's a credit card. Uh, go to AWS, buy something. Right? That does not work, simply because it's too complicated, too complex. So traditionally, uh, we've been solving that problem uh, in the past by saying, hey, if this is too complicated because nobody can know everything, then we need to have completely different teams and have a team that is uh, writing some JavaScript code and another team that is writing maybe Go code and a third team that is managing Kubernetes and a fourth team that is managing something else, and so on and so forth, which is completely opposite of what we are trying to accomplish with, with DevOps, right? Uh, so <clears throat> what really DevOps is, at least from my perspective, is about enabling application developers. I'm intentionally using the word application developers because everybody is a developer, right? Everybody writes code. Uh, we do not have, I hope we don't have any more uh, roles like, hey, I'm ops, I copy and paste from a Word document. Uh, I never wrote a script in my life, or I'm a tester and I just click buttons somewhere, right? Everybody is a developer. Uh, so, but in this context, when I say developer, what I really, really mean is end user application developer, you know, person who writes Node.js that becomes front end of your application. And DevOps is about enabling those teams, like six, seven people per team, maybe eight, to be self sufficient, right? You can do everything. And since I already stated that you cannot be self-sufficient, you cannot do everything by spending years trying to figure out uh, how all those things work, uh, we, cannot apply the, we cannot apply the same logic like what in the past people were here. Who's full-stack developer here? 
only few. That never worked, right? The, 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 it's the same problem we had with full-stack development. Sorry, few of you, only three, four, I think, uh, because it's just too complicated for one person to understand how to... Full-stack means you manage a database, right? And you, uh, you also write front-end and back-end, and all those things. They are different. So, uh, what it really boils down, and we can clearly see this this year uh, by which projects are appearing, especially in CNCF, uh, what companies are adopting, and so on and so forth. That's resurgence or uh, re re uh, renewed uh, attention to platform engineering, right? So, everybody, most of the companies, at least those I work with, are either focused on developing applications, uh, end user applications, or they're focused on creating those platforms, right? Platforms that will enable everybody else to be self-sufficient. Uh, like, hey, this is uh, how you create a cluster. You do not need to open Jira ticket. If I see another Jira ticket I, uh, that says I need a cluster, or another Jira ticket, I need a backend application, or a third Jira ticket, I need a database, I'm going to open a window and jump. Uh, so instead, what we're doing is creating platforms uh, that will enable people to do what they need to do. Just as what AWS or Azure or Google is to ops, those platforms should be to everybody else because they're highly opinionated, they're really performing not what AWS thinks you need, uh, they're not containing building blocks, uh, but containing the solutions we need for the company. Uh, and usually, typically today, we call that IDP or Internal Developer Platform. Uh, and those platforms are all a layer on top of all the tooling, right? Because it doesn't make sense, at least not much sense, for everybody to go and mess with cloud formation, right? Uh, it's about shifting left. It's about really what the real job is for majority of ops, SREs, DevOps, whatever people call themselves today. And the other benefit, apart from the obvious, if people do not need to open Jira ticket, they're happier because nobody was happy ever for opening Jira tickets. Uh, we also get additional benefit that we free ops, uh, whatever ops means. Uh, I'm intentionally using very high level description. Uh, we free ops to work on things that matter, right? Because uh, just as it is silly for app developers to open Jira tickets, it is silly for ops to wait, uh, to wait until somebody asks you to do something and then you execute some command that somebody else could be, have executed and do the same thing over and over and over again. I think it's a similar situation like what we had with manual testing in the past. So, uh, I'm not going to go deep into why self-service is uh, important, uh, self-sufficiency is important. Uh, if you want more details, I strongly recommend checking Dora metrics. Dora metrics are probably the best source of information how actually all that helps. Uh, but what I do want to talk is about uh, the life cycle of an application because that gives us a clue of what we need to do, right? And on a very, very high level, all applications go to four major stages in their life cycle, right? We need to define what we want. Uh, we are not doing any more imperative instructions, kind of install this, uh, do this, do that. Most of us are focused on defining the state that we want, the desired state. We need to perform some actions, like you need to build the binaries, container images, run some tests, whatever happens once and only once for every commit, we need to be able to converge the desired state, what I want, to become the actual state, the reality, wherever you're running that something, some, something, and finally observe, right? Everybody knows that you cannot just deploy something to production and say I'm going to vacation. And if we would start designing such a system today, and I'm fully aware that almost everybody has, or everybody has legacy, we cannot start from scratch completely, right? So I'm not saying that everybody should do something like this. But if we would like to design such a platform today, it would most likely look like this, right? We would have, uh, that doesn't work, uh, some layer on top that we call internal developer platform, that can be a web UI, can be shell commands or uh, CLIs, it can be uh, extensions to IDEs like VS Code or whatever you're using. The exact format of that interface that we would give to people depends really of what, uh, what people are familiar with. And we need some API 
through which all those interfaces would converge and uh, expand into whatever we need, right? And the only, the only really uh, candidate to have something that is extremely extensible and widely accepted by almost everybody today, that's Kubernetes, right? Now, it is important to understand that when I talk about Kubernetes, I do not talk about Kubernetes as something that is designed to run containers, right? That's what most people understand Kubernetes is. That's not what Kubernetes is. That's not what it was designed. Uh, running containers in a cluster just happens to be the first implementation or first variation of the usage of Kubernetes, something we started with. But the goal was always to create extensible API, uh, be drift detection, reconciliation, and all the other good things that we know and love about Kubernetes, right? And we do those extensions through custom resource definitions. Even if you never saw custom resource definitions, but you use Kubernetes, you are having them, right? If you install Argo CD, you're getting CRDs. If you install Flux, you're having CRDs. If you install MongoDB in your cluster and say, this is just a database, you are getting custom resource definitions. All those tools, almost all third-party tools today are extending Kubernetes one way or another. So we have a layer on top that uh, is used for by everybody in, in an organization. And that layer on top, IDP, has two primary functions, right? It has the function to write to change the state of something, and it has a function to observe the state of something. Changing the state is probably nobody disagrees today anymore that the only way to change the desired state of something is to store code in Git, right? Whether that code is YAML or it's JSON or it's Go or it's JavaScript, does not matter. Uh, Git is the source of what we want to accomplish. And the actual state, the state that you observe, those are all your providers, right? AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google, Datadog, whatever you're using, be below those providers, maybe on-prem even, maybe you're on your own provider. Uh, there is some infrastructure with servers, clusters, and so on and so forth, and below all that, there are some, or above all that, there are your applications, right? And everybody these days is multi-cloud. I, I, I don't remember the last time I met, the, I, I was working with a company that is not multi-cloud. Uh, but when I say multi-cloud, what I really mean is that you're using cloud services or something. If you're using AWS, you don't have to use Azure to be multi-cloud. GitHub is a cloud service, right? Uh, Datadog is a cloud service. Everybody uses multiple services of something. And it all converges into Kubernetes at the end of the day. Kubernetes is becoming, clearly, a control plane that manages all that. It manages the desired state or pulls the desired state into itself. We are extending it to custom resource definitions. It is using and executing and running and doing whatever needs to be done with all the tools that we, we have. Those tools are becoming irrelevant for the end user because end users are communicating only with the API of the system. And finally, it is through those tools or directly changing the state of what we have. Now, the tools itself evolved, right? Um, if you want to define what your applications are and what your specs are, and remember, when I talk about Kubernetes, I do not talk about Kubernetes as something that exclusively runs containers. I'm talking about Kubernetes as a control plane. Uh, Whenever we need to define, it doesn't matter whether it's services, infrastructure, applications, we're defining it as Kubernetes manifests. And those manifests are custom, resource, custom resources based on custom resource definitions that are what you define that you have. We have pipelines. Nobody cares about pipelines anymore uh, because they're all more or less uh, doing the same job. Like if you use uh, Argo CD, sorry, Argo workflows or Tekton or GitHub Actions, it's all the same. Uh, because they're having less and less important roles in our lives. We have something that is almost every system today, or most of the system, are having a way to synchronize those two states. That's Argo CD or Flux or Rancher Fleet. There is no third GitOps tool on the market today, at least not that I know. Uh, we have orchestration of our infrastructure that's moving away from traditional SSH-based, uh, CLI-based tools. Uh, into, into Kubernetes as well. It's a very clear tendency over that. Uh, I come from Crossplane. I'm deeply involved in Crossplane project. Uh, so I will, of course, say Crossplane. 
but there are others like SEKs and uh, there is infrastructure as code, your older tools that you can run as Kubernetes operators and so on and so forth. And finally, we need to figure out how we orchestrate our applications. And again, when I say applications, it could be not only containers, it could be lambdas and Google Cloud runs of the world and all those things, right? And for that, most likely you're going to choose, again, either crossplane or open application model with Kubevela. So, yeah, I forgot almost about Tarbeck. Nobody cares about Tarbeck anymore. Everybody was freaking out in the past. What, what do we do with access control? But if nobody has access to your clusters and there is no reason to have access to the clusters except the read mode and everybody is funneled into Git, then your Git becomes the access control. How much time do I have? 40 minutes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, more or less what we do today is, as engineers is either we interact with some API, that's IDP, that's UIs, APIs, Kubernetes, whatever you're using today, or you are interacting with Git, never with the live system. You're writing some code, you're pushing that code to Git. Uh, that code is triggering two types of processes, pipelines, build, test, do whatever you need to do once and ever again, uh, and GitOps processes that are uh, synchronizing the state that you have in Git with the live system. Now, uh, the major question you will ask yourself when you start building a platform, until you, uh, unless you're already building your own platform, is whether you should buy a platform or you should build yourself. And when I say build yourself, I do not mean start from scratch, open Visual Studio Code, uh, create a main.go file and start. Uh, what I really mean by build, I mean uh, what will you use to assemble such a platform. Buying is always a better option uh, if, you can, uh, if you can get away with it. Almost no company can buy a platform simply because they're very opinionated. And by opinionated means that they're almost certainly not doing what you need them to do. Like, I don't know how many of you used Heroku in the past, Right? Uh, Heroku failed for that same reason. Uh, everybody liked it at the very beginning, and then once you started having different requirements than what the opinionated platform offers, you had to move away from there. Uh, so, uh, in my case specifically, I'm very, I already said I'm very focused on Crossplane, and Crossplane is open source project, it's CNCF, I'm not selling you anything, uh, but it's, it's part of that puzzle, part of that piece, that it is a tool that enables you to build platform yourself. It's not the only tool. There are other tools that you will need. Um, and most likely you would assemble something like this, right? You would use Backstage for that graphical user interface. At least most of the, mo most of the projects now are using Backstage. Everything I'm showing here today is completely open source. Uh, Crossplane, if you want to assemble, extend Kubernetes to manage whatever you need to manage, Argo CD or Flux for uh, GitOps pipelines and everything else. Now, I will skip the rest and go straight to the demo because I get nervous if I talk too much without really showing you stuff. So let me show you part of whatever I can do in 10 minutes or less, uh, how that would look like, right? So I will manage my, I've created a cluster and I will manage my applications, or maybe, I'm not sure whether I will have time to do all that, but what is important here is that I will do everything by using very, very simple definitions that are tailor-made for the needs of my organization, for my company, and I will always interact only, at least when writing something with Git. I will not go to a cluster to tell cluster do something, or to AWS, or anything like this. that. So let me copy two files first. Uh, <coughs> Uh, to the directory, this directory. Uh, there we go, sivo.yaml. I will copy it first so that uh, the process starts while I'm explaining what I'm doing. So don't freak out immediately. Um, I think that this is the file, there we go. Infra, AWS, EKS, YAML, Boop. There we go, right, I will add that to Git. I will commit something. I will push it, right? Now, uh, what I actually did, it actually started the other direction. Do you see this? Is this big enough? I hope so. You're very silent. That's okay. That, okay. So, let's say that I want to create a cluster, right? Uh, <coughs> let's say that I want to create a development cluster. I want to create a production cluster. Development cluster I will use today, Sivo. Uh, 
simply because it's extremely fast, it's extremely easy and extremely cheap. Good enough for me for development. I rarely use AWS for, uh, for production. Now, <coughs> AWS is especially tricky. I don't know how many of you have Ops background here, but if you use AWS and you want to create a Kubernetes cluster, let's say EKS, uh, what you need to do is, be ready for this, create subnets, create VPCs, create internet gateway, create EKS cluster, create node group, create roles, create role attachments, and probably 75 other things, um, and then you get something meaningful, right? That's why people open Jira tickets, right? Because nobody can do that. But what I'm going to do, what I just did, actually, and I will show you examples, uh, is create a new service, extend Kubernetes, and say, hey, whenever somebody, anybody in my organization wants to create a cluster, I created something completely new, some completely new custom resource definition called composite cluster uh, in my Kubernetes. Right? This does not come out of the box. This is something I created as an ops person or SRE to help everybody else to manage their own clusters. And all you have to do is a couple of things. First, you need to say which type of cluster you want. I have, uh, I have definitions, implementations of this for Civil, for AWS, Azure, Google, whatever are the needs. And somebody can say, hey, I want small nodes because I have no idea what, what are all the node sizes in AWS or Azure or whatever. And I want to start with one uh, node, one server. Now, um, the second manifest that I pushed to Git, here we go, I think so, there we go. Now, this is exactly the same, those two, right? The, all the complexity, even though creating a cluster in AWS is completely different, nothing to do with Sivo, uh, from the user perspective, from the user experience, they are the same. Uh, I defined composite cluster in both cases, the only really tangible difference here is that I said, hey, I would like to have a cluster in AWS. And since this is serious and we cannot access cluster directly, I also defined a second service for all the, all the work people in my company, fictitious one in this case, uh, that, hey, if you want to enable that cluster to be GitOps ready, you just need to tell me what do you want to use. Do you want Argo CD or Flux? You need to tell me how to find that cluster through a secret. And you need to tell me, and this is the most important one, what is the repository to which you want to push stuff so that things happen in that cluster? As a result of that, now I'm switching from being a developer to ops. Uh, you can see those three manifests, those three definitions created, if this works, demos fail. Seven minutes, you're fine, I guess. It will happen or not. We'll see. This is me doing, raising the suspension. There we go, right? Um, those three YAMLs created all those things, right? Because all those things, are one way or another, are important and absolutely necessary. Here's one cluster in Sivo. That one is easy. Those are the subnets that were created in AWS. Now. Some of you might have noticed that it looks like I'm cheating, that this was created 23 hours ago. That's true, because last night I actually executed the same command, because it takes half an hour to create stuff in AWS, which is the slowest of the slowest. Uh, but I executed the same command, so uh, I'm not really, I just save you some time. Anyways, I, uh, those three simple definitions created subnets and internet gateways and VPCs and security groups and RAD tables and cluster and node groups and so on and so forth. And they already prepared those clusters to be production ready with all the applications for observability, for monitoring, for this or that are over there, right? So it's not only about creating clusters, it's making them usable in one way or another. Uh, and that was much simpler, right? It's much easier for the developers in my organization to use service like this than to figure out how to create all that because no human being can do it without not doing anything else for a year. So, um, I don't have much time, so let me show you how I would deploy without deploying an application. Actually, let me first show you how I did all this, right? 
I did it by defining two things. And now, now we're entering into what Crossplane does, right? Uh, the way how I accomplish all that. And trust me, the same logic applies to databases, to applications, to anything. You're creating services, and there are two steps, two things we need to do. One is to create open API schema that says, hey, this new thing in Kubernetes, this new custom resource definition should have this schema. And this is whatever you want it to be. If you remember the YAML I showed you before, you saw version and node size and minimum number of no nodes or min node count. This is me doing the work before to make all this happen, creating a schema and saying from this, from, from this moment on, whenever there is a new type of resource in Kubernetes called composite cluster, and this is the schema of that resource. Very simple, very easy. Anybody ever working with any type of schemas should feel at home. And the second, much more complicated and uh, labor-intensive thing that I had to do is to create implementations of those services. And implementation is here, right? This is me saying, hey, whenever somebody uses that simple schema and that is that and chooses specific implementation, like in this case AWS, this is all these are all the things that need to happen. You need to create a cluster, you need to connect that cluster to you need to uh, process some parameters. You need to create a node group. In a node group, you need to specify that whenever somebody says medium, this is what it means in AWS. You need to connect those services and so on and so forth, right? A huge list. This, you will have to do all this in AWS, no matter which tool you're using, no matter which tool you choose, no matter what you really want. It's just the question whether you will do it in YAML or you will do it in HCL or in whichever language you chose for Pulumi and so on and so forth. Um, I, don't have, I don't have time left, so uh, I'm going to skip the rest of the demo, and you have three minutes uh, for questions. Be fast, because they, they said that at the top of the hour I'm going to be kicked out of this stage, so I cannot stay longer even if I want to. Come on. Questions. Uh, well, think about questions. I have a YouTube channel. Check it out. I have a podcast. Check it out. Uh, I work for Upbound. Be the company behind Crossplane, open source, not selling you anything. Check it out as well. And that's about it. That's me today. <laughs>